are joined by Bob Zelig. Bob, you know, we were talking about U.S. growth, and over the last couple of days, a lot of economists have told us they're concerned that the U.S. is stimulating the economy too much. They're not really thinking longer term, and as soon as the bond vigilantes pick up on that, there might be a real concern that we're going to see what's happening in Europe move over across the Atlantic. Are you worried about that? Um, not so much directly. I think, you know, it's, it's be odd to say that some good growth in the United States wouldn't be a good thing for the international economy. Um, I think, unfortunately, the growth is still going to be modest enough. You're going to have uh, still large-scale unemployment. That's going to be a problem. And I think what people are referring to, which is correct, is, is that at the same time the United States has to focus on some of the medium and long-term issues, and particularly the debt buildup, the spending, and one can't just look at the, the quarter by quarter or short-term numbers. And that's a little bit of a function of the international economy we're in now. You've got this multi-speed recovery, so in the emerging markets have been growing well, they need to actually level up. Off. They're starting to face the challenge of inflation, asset price bubbles, even the danger of, of uh, maybe some boom bust. In Europe, which has been a little bit slower, the real story is obviously sovereign debt and how to navigate around uh, the shoals of that problem. For all of them, including the United States, one has to focus also on long-term growth. So I think some of the comments are the idea that one can't just focus on the immediate and you have to make sure you that in this case the U.S. government puts in the policies to deal with the long-term spending and, and debt issue. Uh, you're talking about asset bubbles and this is again a concern that we've heard a lot about here in, in Davos. Is it commodity asset bubbles or is it construction in certain emerging economies such as China? Well it, it varies because you've got great diversity all across the developing world but in general um, a number of those economies came back quite well and so some of them are facing what would normally uh, expect to face at this point in the cycle. It can be driven by different factors. For some, uh, it may be uh, structural bottlenecks uh, that as they start to grow, they start to run into difficulties. For some, as they grow, they're drawing more money into their markets, and then they have to decide are they going to appreciate their currencies, what they do with their interest rates. Then you have some other shifts that are partly secular, like the increase in food prices, which I think we're going to be living with for a while, plus perhaps some events which could exacerbate. It. So I think in the emerging markets, the question is how to manage that problem. And in the United States, it's a slightly different one. And at the international level, that creates a challenge because these leaders are really having to deal with different problems and they want to make sure their solutions don't add to somebody else's problems. And, and this, of course, is very telling of, of what is happening in Europe because we are seeing also two-speed Europe. Yes. How do you handle that? And is 2011 going to be an even more difficult year for the euro because of speculation and because of these worries that it's going to break up the eurozone? Well, I think the, the key is to first uh, make sure you stop things that could have big downside risk. And so there it's the sovereign credit issue. And I, in my view at this point is primarily an issue of keeping liquidity available. This is the role for the ECB and the European uh, funds backing it. That won't solve the long-term problem. It buys some time, but it makes sure that the problem doesn't get worse. Then at another level, just as in the United States, people are going to have to be focusing on some of the long-term structural growth policies, as people did in Germany before, which is one reason why uh, Germany has been doing better. So I think there's going to need to be a, a policy mix. And of course, uh, in countries like Britain, uh, there's the question of their own debt and deficit build up and so they're trying to get the long-term addressing of that at the same time they're trying to make sure that they keep their their demand going for basic growth. George Soros put it to us very clearly he thinks the UK are just cutting too much in terms of austerity measures. Do you agree? Not necessarily. I, I think the, the, the problem is people can't run governments just responding quarter to quarter and I think markets would re react to that. I think what the British government has done and what the British public is understanding is there have been too much in the way of spending and debt buildups. They've got to have a long-term approach to signals that they're committed to get out of that. Uh, at the margin, will they and the parliament adjust? I suspect that will be part of the politics of the process. But I think the long-term direction that the government has set is an important one. Growth is not really knocking at our back door. At the same time, interest rates are so low, it's fueling inflation. How do you deal with this? Well, that's where it depends on some different markets. So uh, growth in emerging markets, yes, strong. Now about half of global growth. That's good for developed markets, too, because that often uh, fuels their exports. So in those markets, you would expect interest rates to increase. Um, in the case of uh, the United States and Europe, different posture. We're going to need a different monetary policy. But it's not a danger that actually the 
central banks look at each other and say, well, I can't afford to raise my interest rates until they move, because otherwise it puts me in a more defavorable position. Uh, it could be, and that's why, in general, it's better to move towards a system where you do have autonomous monetary policies, flexible exchange rates, so that people can deal with their own uh, national markets. But you're definitely right. It's all one international economy. And that goes to the point of when you have a multi-speed recovery, it's going to require different policies in different locations and some sense of being careful that you don't set off protectionist actions either with finance or trade that would bring everybody down. Uh, what um, role can the World Bank play in China? Can you be a catalyst for investment in China? Well, we certainly have, uh, but on a more basic level, but China does pretty well in investment uh, on its own at this point. We're now actually working with China most on environmental issues. Uh, that's the sector that they realized that they didn't appreciate enough with the early growth. But also we're working with them analytically about the next stage of reforms. For example, this debate you hear about moving to more domestic demand, um, how to increase the consumption as opposed to savings, the structural changes. And I think the Chinese uh, have been very wise. They're now asking questions for the next stage, such as how do you avoid the middle income trap? Mm -hmm. These are countries when they get to three to six thousand dollars per capita income a year, sometimes it slows down. So uh, China is also a global player. So we also work with China in its investments in uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, um, and they're now also trying to help us with some of our larger development prospects. So what you're seeing is a world where the old north-south model doesn't work. You've got south-south, south-north, north-south, and the bank, the World Bank helps interact. But the World Bank has said in the past that actually in the very long run, the U.S. dollar may lose its dominant position as a reserve currency. What kind of time frame are we talking about? Uh, actually, the U.S. hasn't, or the, the World Bank hasn't said that, and I certainly haven't said that. I believe that the dollar will remain the predominant uh, reserve currency. A lot of reasons for that. But I do believe you'll see other uh, reserve currencies. And so you've already seen this with the euro, but the euro's future partly depends on how they deal with the issues of today. So one of the issues looking out is how do you create a framework for monetary relations where the United States dollar remains the predominant but not the only currency. But with other ones then? Yes, and, that, and that, those are also issues that obviously relate to your point about independent monetary yeah. policies, China moving towards a more open capital account. And I do think those are some of the discussions that President Sarkozy has invited in the G20 context. Uh, but to talk me through exactly, if you can clarify, you would have what the U.S. dollar still is, reserve currency, and then what are other currencies that, that could, you know, if not rival, at least match? Well, um, the euro has uh, increased in terms of uh, countries' holdings of reserves. Um, you have a role for uh, the yen and the pound. Um, and I think over time, when it moves to an open capital account, the Chinese renminbi will play these roles. Uh, the first group are members of what are called the special drawing rights, which is uh, a tool that the IMF has. My own belief is that one should encourage China to move towards towards an open capital account and also be uh, part of that system. I think at this stage, the, it's important for the G7 currencies to try to have flexible exchange rates, uh, not intervene to the disadvantage of others unless all agree. Then with some of the rising powers, they're facing hot capital flows. They should move to flexible exchange rates and autonomous monetary policies so they deal with their local inflation. But in the meantime, we're going to have to help deal with some of these hot capital issues. And I think there's a role for the IMF as a form of reference in this system. Now, we've also heard from President Sarkozy uh, saying that actually one way to deal possible, possibly with inflation and food prices would be to regulate the commodity markets. Is this a real possibility? I, I think he's, he's focused on a very important issue. And when I spoke to him, I suggested that we put food first in this uh, G20 context. We talk about financial safety nets. We should also have food safety nets because I think that's a real danger for the most vulnerable. I would suggest targeting it more. Uh, we have a number of sessions here at Davos where we're talking about making sure that those that are most vulnerable, um, pregnant, lactating mothers, children under two, get special support. Um, I think there's things one could do by stopping export bans which uh, exacerbate the problem of price volatility. Uh, information in markets in terms of, of, of stocks. And then where you have the most vulnerable, uh, for example, in the Horn of Africa, it may make sense to work with the World Food Program to have some stocks, not big stocks everywhere, but in places where it's hard to get food in. So I think there's a 
multiplicity of things one can do. Mm -hmm. People often say, well, let's regulate and control the market, but I'm from the Midwest in Illinois. I, is a, when a farmer uh, sells corn futures, is that uh, a speculator? Is the person who buys it a speculator? It gets tricky fast. Paul, thank you so much. Bob Zellick there, World Bank President.